Welcome to Idle Red Hands, a podcast from Japan about gaming and gamer life. And welcome to the Idle Red Hands. I'm Lau. I'm Jeremy. And today we're going to be talking about Star Trek Adventures. Right, the new 2D20 RPG. Yeah, it's newish. Yeah, and this is kind of inspired by our previous discussion. We were reviewing Star Trek Discovery and talking about kind of what setting would be best for a Star Trek RPG. So we'll find out what they decided. Just to give people a baseline, uh, when we're doing this review of Star Trek Adventures, but neither one of us are much of a Star Trek fan. Right. <laughs> we're missing Chris from even, our discussion. Even though we've done uh, Star Trek Discovery and now Star Trek Adventures. I'd be curious to see at the end of this episode if this game makes me more of a star trek fan i don't know i wasn't a star trek hater mm -hmm. but certainly not a fan right but now that I've, i'm watching star trek discovery and now mm -hmm. i've read through this role-playing game am i going to go back and watch star trek episodes mm -hmm. yeah, do i want to play this game yeah so stay tuned till the end this is a read-through review, which means that we've read through the book. We haven't actually played the game. Right. And what we'll do is we'll walk you through the book. By the book, we mean the PDF. So mm -hmm. we can't really comment on the binding of the book or how good it looks in, right. in the print. Mm -hmm. But we can certainly talk about the appearance on a PDF. And we'll walk you through what's in the book, how it's presented, and our thoughts on it. Mm. And of course, we'll also be talking about the D20 system. Other games that use the D20 system are as in the Mutant Chronicles and Conan, uh, Adventures in the Age of Dream. <laughs> yes. And one improvement they've made with Star Trek Adventures is they've just shortened the title. Right. Yeah. We'll also be comparing the 2D20 system to those versions of it. Mm. So if you're familiar with 2D20, certainly listen through and see if, if this is an improvement on it, about the same, mm -hmm. or if it's a, a worse version of it. And that's really important, I think, whether or not a system and an IP uh, blends well together. Starting off, if we just kind of want to go through the book, the thing that was striking about how they set up this book is the first 70 pages are kind of setting and mm -hmm. lore and background. Yep. What did you think about how they presented it? Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you, yeah, maybe give away a little bit of my thoughts on it. Mm -hmm. I thought the book got better as I read it. <laughs> yes. And one of the reasons was because I didn't like how the fluff was mm -hmm. presented. Mm -hmm. And like Jeremy said, it, it's 70 pages of, of a book that's over 300 pages. And it felt like a really long 70 pages. Yeah. And a really so repetitive long. 70 pages. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think, yeah, I mean, they made some choices and I can understand why they made them. Mm -hmm. And maybe if I was a super fan, mm. I would have appreciated it more. I think so. I think there was definitely a lot of things in there that I wasn't getting. Like you, you're reading these reports and these communications and the person that signed it or the school they were from or the yeah. planet they're from should have meant a lot. And it didn't mean so much to me. Yeah. So their opinion, because you, know, you kind of got contradictory opinions about the prime directive and, and mm -hmm. certain things that to kind of give you a more full view of that world. And it didn't make a lot of sense who these opposing forces were or who these voices were when I right. was reading through it. And just to back up, uh, and this is just a comment on the overall design, both in the layout, and that includes both the way the font is presented, the way the, the text is laid out, and mm -hmm. also the colors they use. Mm. It's very much designed to represent the screens. I guess you saw Next Generation, right? which it was more white text on black, or you do get the printer-friendly PDF, yes. which is a uh, black text on white but if you want what the book looks like then it's that black with like orange and pink right. piping and, yeah and, and i've heard bordering. Some, some people mention online that even the printer friendly version has a few very unprinter friendly parts where they're mm -hmm. actually using pastel colors for some of the text and things especially the character sheet right. if you print that in black and white you've got a lot of very faint gray graphics and, and text and then they have throughout the book they'll have the schematics right right that you you would see throughout the ship or you post it like, oh, here's what the, the Akira class starship is. And mm -hmm. So they, it definitely looks very Star Trek. Yes. So it does bring you in. I normally don't like white on black, mm -hmm. but I didn't find it difficult to read or no, chore no. at all. But then, as Jeremy said, they really wanted to, not only did they have the design making it look like something you would see in Star Trek, they would have reports like, coming through as if you were reading them as a Starfleet officer. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the, at least in the fluff side, it's written as if you were like a Starfleet officer or mm -hmm. a Starfleet cadet explaining things to you. Right. Certainly that's the choice. They really want yeah. to 
bring you into Star Trek, and I would say they're leaning more towards a Star Trek fan. Yeah, somebody who would so. appreciate all of that. Right, and I think I think definitely to run the game, you would have to be a pretty big fan to kind of see all the moving parts and kind of know how things interacted. If you're using their source books, it would be another story. But if you wanted to kind of satisfyingly have certain alien races interacting correctly and and also the things that you're going to run into with uh, the distinction in the timelines yeah who hasn't been encountered yet what technology yeah. they don't have yet i'll agree with you in the sense that the core book very much relies on the person having a lot of knowledge of star trek but i don't think you need to be a star trek fan to play the game mm. if everybody kind of understands that hey you're not a star trek fan so maybe the ferengi are going to show up mm -hmm. in a different point in the timeline than they do in the, in the series. <laughs> right, right. And if everybody can accept that, then I think, yeah, yeah, I could see you could play it with the information they provide. Mm -hmm. So let's kind of walk you through structured. So as Jeremy said, it, the first 70 or so pages is fluff. After you get through a very brief introduction, then they have these different chapters. And one thing I'll say about the layout is sometimes it can get confusing what is a chapter and what is a subchapter. Mm -hmm. It's very clear when you look back at the table of contents. But when you're reading through it, the subchapters have a, a very bold title that's very similar to the main chapter title. Mm, yes. Although the main chapter gets its own cover page. <laughs> right. But then you forget and you're like, is this an entire chapter? <laughs> it's like two pages. Yeah, that's true. So that yeah. did throw me. That's a, I suppose, a nitpick. And it almost seems like the design of the book itself, it did kind of work better on a screen. It made a little bit more sense color-wise and readability-wise yeah. how well the print book actually works. Well, there's the introduction which introduces people to the role-playing games in general mm -hmm. and very vaguely to the, the Star Trek adventures. Mm -hmm. It seemed a bit longer than it had to be, but mm -hmm. there you are. Some people have a page. They have almost 10 pages wow, on that. Yeah, but but yeah. they give you an example. <laughs> but it's got to oh, be done. that was very long. Yeah, that, that, was, that was something I was surprised about is there okay well we're gonna kind of explain how this works and here's a really really long example of yeah. role play that was that was a, a little excessive i guess to in introduce concepts and then it is a pretty heavy book there's a lot of mechanics for doing things that they if you're very new to role playing might be a little bit much so yeah just to give everybody a heads up we, <laughs> yeah. we are going to walk through the mechanics we think that it's worthwhile to walk through them so mm. hopefully bear with <laughs> yes bear with us <laughs> and find it interesting but yeah it is a pretty heavy in that regard so mm -hmm. yeah i guess that's why they did it but mm. i mean it's one of those things because at the beginning of every role-playing book somebody like me yeah. just kind of skips over it right right occasionally i will start to read it to see hey is this good for a new person but here it was too long i was mm. just like ah, i can't skip to yeah, yeah skip to the next chapter which is the united federation of planets and <laughs> there it's divided there's the overview the early history the 23rd century and the recent federation history it's a lot of background and when you're going through it especially as, as a player you're not really sure how important you know where you're going to be playing and how important a lot of the information is. For me, it was interesting because I didn't have a lot of background. I just have kind of basic understanding of the timeline in Star Trek. So there were some interesting details about when things were discovered and when yeah. treaties were signed and when, when kind of exploration occurred into different zones. It, it seemed like a lot. It seemed like a lot and a little mm -hmm. in, in it, that... Mm. This part, and, and I didn't actually mind the overview so much, in that it talked about there's different quadrants and what you would find in the different quadrants right. of the Milky Way galaxy. And it actually had a very helpful map that provided the quadrants. Mm -hmm. Not like you look at the Milky Way and go, I know exactly where Earth is. <laughs> but I, I did find the map good. And then it sort of gives you a diplomatic rundown of the different races. Mm -hmm. So it's talking about, like, for example, the Cardassians, but not so much as the Cardassians and what they are, but the Cardassians' relationship to the United Federation of Planets, mm. which I guess makes sense. And we should make this very clear clear in this entire book yeah. you are playing a starfleet officer or right. like a, a new cadet mm -hmm. fresh out of the academy well, experienced be, yeah, officer right, or right. a veteran officer right that's what you're playing yes yes if you want to play a, a smuggler no maybe another book mm -hmm. you want to play somebody in playing on empire no maybe another book yeah i think that draws a, a really big line of distinction between this rpg and say the fantasy flight star wars rpgs where they're trying to cover every angle every possible aspect or maybe it's similar in that the Fantasy Flight Star Wars very much divided it. Ah, right. So this might be the Starfleet version. Or Star yeah. yeah, the Starfleet kind of beginning. And maybe if there's a demand, they might come up with this yeah. Klingon source well, book. It sounds like, I mean, we haven't gotten to character creation yet, but there, I did read complaints about the limit limited number of alien races and that's something like it's it's competition right now hmm. starfinder is just throwing more alien races than you know what to do with plus all of the hmm. old world kind of fantasy races as well are all playable really okay because yeah. when, when i read that i kind of jumping ahead i did feel satisfied with the amount mm -hmm. 
and but more so than when I looked at the Starfinder book, especially with the adversaries. But yeah, well, I mean, we'll, we'll cover that and, mm -hmm. and people can judge for themselves if they've given enough. Mm -hmm. So we have a little bit of a disagreement here. Mm -hmm. okay, but I did remember thinking to Starfinder when I was reading the back about the adversaries going, huh, this seems like quite a lot to work with, especially right. in a core book. That's yeah. true. Yeah, I think yeah, Starfinder was was a little weak in, in that aspect, but I yeah. think following it up very quickly with their kind of alien codex, yeah. hopefully they were going to remedy that. But yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Back to the overview. I mean, mm -hmm. it gives you a rundown of who the major empires are mm -hmm. or the major adversaries are and the relationship to Starfleet. People who are more neutral. I mean, there's, uh, like the Ferengi, also the Orion Syndicate, which I was unfamiliar with. Mm -hmm. And that's presented as, hey, here's just some information for you. I, it's kind of like you're a Starfleet cadet mm -hmm. presented, but it's just text and explaining things to you. Yeah. But pretty typical for a role-playing book. Yes. Yeah. And I thought that was okay. Mm -hmm. Although I was reading it going, if I didn't know who the Kardashians were, I'm under a rock, I didn't know who the Klingons were, mm -hmm. I don't think I'd be getting enough to figure out who they were or really get a handle on it. Yeah, they, they do present yeah a, a variety of information, and, but it is not very deep. I think some of the races... I mean, I knew who the Dominion were because mm -hmm. of Deep Space Nine, but I didn't really get too much about them. I was like, aren't, aren't some of them shapeshifters? But... It didn't get that yeah, yeah. from that overview. Right, right. Maybe the tone is correct because if they are really trying to, if, if the simulation, if what they're trying to create is the feeling of going through Starfleet Academy and the textbooks that you're going to be forced, even if you're not interested in aliens, you're interested in a technology, you're going to have to read about aliens. So giving you an overview of everything, which I'm not sure for super fans, if it would be that interesting, because they would just read the few paragraphs about each of the empires and the alien yeah. race and be like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think they did a nice job of simulating the setting of what they're going for, Starfleet yeah. Academy, but maybe not satisfying either people that are not familiar with the world or people people that are very familiar with the world. It's right. somewhere in, in between. Yeah, I mean, it's tough because it's an overview, but then it follows up by more information. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Where if it had been, I think Mutant Chronicles does this, where it provides an overview mm -hmm. and then gives you rules. Yes. And then there's more background after the rules. Mm -hmm. And this is decided to put all the fluff in the beginning. Right, right. And then there's rules afterwards. Kind of the age old debate is, hey, should we put the rules and you don't really know the setting mm -hmm. and then you read through the rules and then you get to the setting or should you put the setting and... Then you get the rules. Yeah. yeah. You could throw Star Trek Adventures into this debate mm -hmm. and see what people think. Mm. I probably would have mixed it up a little bit more, but I can certainly yeah. understand why they went with this. Yeah, um, I, I think so. I think it, it feels very like a textbook, very kind of educational. They, they really kind of gradually got you into, oh, now we're in character creation. Like, you know, things kind of slid. It, it wasn't like, oh, this is the second half of the book with rules. They started mm -hmm. to, now you're in the Academy. For what they chose to do, which is a Starfleet RPG, I think it had a, a correct flavor. And they followed up overview with the early history. And here is where they made a stylistic choice to present the early history as all excerpts and blurbs. Yes. Starfleet logs mm -hmm. and diplomatic memos and things like that. Right. In its entirety. It's not like mixed with a, an explanation yes. and some excerpts that mm -hmm. add more flavor. Or, or sometimes you would present something like here's the way that commonly understood history. And then somebody chimes in, well, you know, what really happened? What right. Happened? Yeah, yeah. That's right. It wasn't like a counterpoint or no. like a flavor. It wasn't flavor text to kind of give you a different view or more varied view. Yeah, it was just kind of back and forth yeah. between the, you know, on certain topics. Yeah, I'm not sure like, what we would call that. It's almost like a multimedia approach. And I first encountered it with the White Wolf books, like The uh, Vampire, where they would mm -hmm. they would present like the main body of the text and they would have like a little note to somebody or a letter right. to somebody. And then I also saw it in the Battle Tech books. Right. And again, they would combine them. They would have like, here's the main history or a main rundown of the events. And then you would have like a, like a ship May Day or something like mm. that. And I, I thought that was really well done. Mm -hmm. But I could certainly see that if it's not well done, then it just gets annoying. Yeah. And yeah. unfortunately, in Star Trek Adventures, I, I just couldn't follow this early history. You start with earlier excerpts mm -hmm. and you end with later excerpts. <laughs> but I really didn't get a, a good idea of what the early history was. Right. And sometimes I would recognize the names. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe if you were a Star Trek fan, you would go, yes. Yeah, right. Now, right. Yeah, oh, that's referring to this. And <laughs> it's good. Oh, that's what he was thinking at the time. And maybe that was really rewarding. But for somebody like who's kind of just looking for the early history, I found it frustrating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it was not an easy approach. And especially with every excerpt was a different color and had a little bit different design. And there's, you know, logos everywhere. 
Tupperware and Klingon writing and things compared to just doing a kind of historical text and mm-hmm. then giving you some flavor. Yeah, the, another book that did that was D&D did the Volo's Guide, the kind of monster oh, yeah. manual. Yeah. And so, yeah, there was the, the monster entries and then like notes about kind of the opinion, the, the monster hunters kind of description and, and flavor. And I think that works well, but there was no main text for this section. It was just a series yeah. of flavor. And then the next part, the 23rd century, they switch back to more Again, just presenting you with information. Right. This with the the conceit is that you are a new recruit. Oh, no, you're a new captain. Mm-hmm. And somebody is explaining stuff to a new captain or what it's going to be like. I guess a more experienced captain or an admiral right, right. is explaining what the situation is right now. Mm-hmm. Here, I, I got the idea that the book is set in the next generation mm-hmm. era. Mm-hmm. Because everything here from the overview until this point is next generation and that there is a dominion. There is a Borg. Right. right. Uh, later on in the book, uh, in character creation, in fact, they present the three eras. Mm-hmm. And they would be the Enterprise era. And I guess that's Scott Bakula. Right. Yeah, the original right, right. series era, that would be uh, William Shatner, Captain Kirk. Yes. And Next Generation, which mm-hmm. is like almost all the other series. Right. Everything. Yeah. yeah. I think in the, in the summary, I can't remember... If it was like on the back of the book or if it was like an introductory note, they said, this is what's happening right now. These events have happened. So each of the major kind of television series that followed the next generation, they said, this has happened. This has happened. Deep Space Nine exists. You know, Mm -hmm. Voyager exists. You know, all of these things are happening right now. Yeah, it gives you a pretty good idea of that setting. And then they also make a lot of notes about, okay, but if you want to play in a different era, this is what you have to kind of remove. This is what hasn't happened. Yep. And then that's followed up with recent Federation history, which gets into more excerpts. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was pretty tired at this point. (laughs) Yes. I think for what they were going for, the the approach worked. But yeah, as far as just reading through the book and immersing yourself in Star Trek, it it wasn't as an an enjoyable experience as I think I I could have had if they would have approached it differently. Yeah. Yeah. Then it moves into your continuing mission. Mm -hmm. And now it's shifting the focus from the Federation to you and what Starfleet is and Starts off with Starfleet's purpose. And right. Walks you through, emphasizing it's not a military machine, but got exploration and mm-hmm. diplomatic things. Right. And then it gets into the Prime Directive. And here, I thought excerpts worked. Yes. It actually presents yes. the Prime Directive and then some people's experiences with the Prime Directive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, kind of like a, a counter argument, you know, how, how this is working. Yeah. Does it function the way it was intended? Yeah. yeah, there's a captain saying, oh, this is what happened and... Hey, how come the Klingons don't have a prime directive? But no, I thought that was very well done. And Mm -hmm. that's, I mean, the prime directive, I think it's only about two or three pages. That's a textbook example of how to combine or how to insert an excerpt. Right. Because you present, here's what the prime directive is. This is what you need to know. Mm -hmm. So if you don't watch a lot of Star Trek and you kind of like heard it, but not familiar, this is what it is. Mm -hmm. And then people going, hey, but here's the problems, which kind of catches you up to the the rabid Star Trek fan who wa- watches all of these oh, right. episodes and sees yeah, Captain Kirk or Captain Picard mm-hmm. struggle with the Prime Directive. Yes. And then here you got a couple excerpts that here's some struggles. Right. That does kind of bring you up to current mm-hmm. Star Trek thinking. I think that that does work very well because without having experienced all that television, you do have a, a sense of how kind of contested or the, the varied thinking about why are we doing this or, or how well it's actually working. Right. Then it gets into Starfleet Academy, mm-hmm. what happens there, your assignment. I think it by this point, and here we're looking at like page 56, page 62. Right. I was really getting tired yeah. of, the, of, the, of reading this because it did yeah, seem samey. Got it. Just, Got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it was like a community college course in uh, Star Trek, Starfleet uh, Community College. Yeah, where the professor would go, okay, now we covered this last week, but I think it bears repeating. <laughs> Even though more information was being introduced or being introduced in a different way, Mm -hmm. it did feel like it was just repeating itself. Yeah. (laughs) Then we get into duties, Mm -hmm. what the duties are. And then, which is good, like science, uh, like exploration, diplomatic missions. Mm. But it's the duties of the crew of the ship. Right. But then they have another subchapter on away team. Yes. And their duties. Mm -hmm. I think until they introduce uh, another mechanic later... In the book, I think that is a little maybe worrying for some players like, well, I'm going to have a very specific role and I may not Mm. be involved in a lot of things. I may be on the ship all the time. So why am I worried about what an away team does? When I'm creating my character, why should I be worrying about these skills? I'm going to be very specifically a science officer, a medical officer doing something that may Mm. not involve me in things. But I think they handle that in a a really nice way because that is something that even the logic of the, the television show kind of struggles with who's on the away team and 
and how does that function and who stays on the ship. And yeah, uh, yeah I think they, they do a good job of kind of handling that and don't have somebody just sitting back and maintaining <laughs> while everyone else is uh, planet side. Sure. Yeah. I mean, maybe that's why they separated the away team and made it its own thing so people could see like, um, I'm going to be... Yeah. On the ship, but I kind of can see what I'm going to do more traditional adventuring kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But reading it was like, wouldn't that just be part of their duties? Is away team yeah. is one of the duties? <laughs> right. But now it's a separate yeah. thing. We'll break down away team duties. But yeah, yeah. it is what it is. Uh, well, they, yeah. And they provide some nice pictures mm -hmm. uh, of uh, the away team in action. Mm -hmm. Despite all of their, hey, it's kind of scientific and diplomatic. And then they show the away team dealing with disaster. Phasers <laughs> right. out. Uh, right. Maybe because the the way that they present or the way that, you know, later in the book in the Game Master section, they're talking about tasks and setting up, you know, the, the scenario and the task. And I think that has a different relationship with the away team and, and how they function than it would anybody that's staying on the ship. So, yeah, there's a, there's a little bit of a, of a distinction there that I, th that I think is interesting hmm. in, in the way that they do that. Because it, it's something, you know, if you have any experience with the TV show that is very obvious, there's hmm. a lot of things that happen on the ship and then a lot of things that happen planet side. And they're very different. The, the dynamics yeah. are, yeah, very different. And that ends the fluff portion of mm -hmm. the book. It doesn't mean that they don't talk about the Star Trek universe later on, mm -hmm. but that is explicitly, here's the setting, here's what Starfleet is. Right. There are no rules in that portion. Right. Yeah, nothing. Yeah, yeah so you, that, and that's what I was kind of saying that might cause some concern with players that have just read to that point. How is this going to work? Okay, you've told me yeah. I'm a you know Starfleet cadet, and how do I decide what, what I'm going to do? Like, you know, what in this game, what am I actually going to be doing besides yeah. sitting, sitting? Yeah, because it's it very much... Much, uh, high level explanations of what is Starfleet and that mm, yes. versus like what's my character going to be mm -hmm. Uh, guy who's ready to put the book down. <laughs> He's really ready to put the book down. <laughs> but I had to, you had to, you had to uh, soldier on to see what that 2D20 system was going to do this time. Yeah, yeah. And then gets into operations and I was like, oh, please, please don't let this be <laughs> explaining. Oh, it's rules. Yes, okay, yeah. Nice. <laughs> so, they, so operations is the rules section. Mm -hmm. and Thank you. Normally, I don't get to the rules section of a book going, yes, you know? <laughs> please tell me about dice. But here I did. And uh, the operation starts with an introduction, and it starts with an introduction of the 2D20 system. Mm -hmm. So it's probably a good idea for us to give you an introduction yes. to the 2D20 system. And then it talks a little bit more how it's integrated. From previous videos or podcasts, you've heard us talk about 2D20. So this is a system where for a skill check or a task, I think that in, in Star Trek, they're calling them task rolls. Yeah. But a skill check, you're rolling two 20-sided die and you're rolling under a derived score for a success. And a one is a, a double success and a 20 is a critical failure that mm -hmm. generates complications. Yeah. So there's to a 2D20 system, there are well, say three types of dice. Right. There's the, the D20, so mm -hmm. the 2D20. The minimum you would roll here is 2D20, but mm -hmm. you can roll up to 5D20. Right. And right. we'll talk about that a little bit later. There's the D6, which is mm -hmm. rarely used. It's primarily used to to roll on charts, right. Right? like in character creation mm -hmm. or when you're making a planet or something. And there's a thing called the challenge die. Mm -hmm. Now, that's actually a D6, but Modiphius makes its own special die or right. special dice. Because they have a symbol that represents the effect. Yeah, the Federation yeah. symbol is on a, on a regular D6, it's the 6. Yeah. yeah, and here it's the, yeah, the, like Jeremy's saying, the Federation symbol. Yeah, insignia. Yeah. Insignia, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Here the challenge die is very similar to the different special dice yeah, the, in the Conan. The dark symmetry in, yeah. in, in, in uh, Mutant yeah. Chronicles. And it's primarily used for damage. Right. There's like rare instances it's used for something else, but it's pretty much used for damage. Yes. So on a D6... Mm -hmm. Or on the challenge die, one and two equals damage. Yes. Like one damage, two damage. Right. Three and four, five mean nothing. Yeah. Actually, I think with the Star Trek, five and six both have the insignia. Oh, five and six. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah three, so and four, three and four, nothing. nothing. And one five and two. Five and six yeah. will, will give you an effect. When you're rolling. So uh, the damage for a weapon is a certain number of those D6s. And so you're rolling yeah. with a 30% chance. And one thing I find a little bit confusing, but yeah, they certainly make it clear in this book and the rules. So the, the five and six on the die are mm. the insignia. Yes. But the entire dice, the entire die itself is the insignia. So as D Jeremy says, when it it says about the weapon damage, it will say four Starfleet oh, insignia. Right, right. And that actually means rolling four of that dice instead of like four of that effect. That right. It's just something mm. to be aware of. It, I got a little bit confused in Mutant Chronicles when because it, it shows the symbol and I wasn't sure if it meant when I rolled that or if it meant... I roll that dice. Yes. Kind yes. of thing. Right. Yeah, when they, I roll that effect or versus I have to roll that dice. Yeah, I think that is a, a little confusing. And they, and they 
rely heavily on that instead of just saying D6, you know, use your special D6, you know, they're, they're using that. So two Federation insignia <laughs> is, is the two D is means two D6. Yeah. Yeah. That's the basics of the 2D20 system. Mm -hmm. And then it gets into basic operations and it excuses for the jargon that they use. I think it's just worthwhile because I really like how they incorporated the jargon. They give something a specific name, but then they reference it over and over and over again. And yes. you realize why they're giving these a specific name and making it its own thing. Mm -hmm. It's because they've really incorporated it throughout the rules. So. Right. Some of the terms are kind of commonplace or kind mm -hmm. of yeah. kind of generic, and you're, you're wondering why such an emphasis on that. But it does make sense when you're talking about how the systems are interacting. So first off, it talks about scenes and encounters. Mm -hmm. And a scene is, as you would imagine, and they reference like a Star Trek scene. Mm -hmm. And I've seen in a TV show. Right. So it's pretty clear. And an encounter, and I thought this was nicely worded, it, it's a tightly structured scene that deals with conflict. Right. So that was pretty clear distinction. Mm -hmm. And I, I think this is really good in that the rules are very well written. Yes. And very yes. clearly written. Mm -hmm. So there's very few points in the rules where you're ever confused by what they mean. Then we get into traits. They define that as a trait is a fact about something. And right. then they give you some examples. They have a, a situation trait, mm -hmm. for example, darkness, a location trait, for example, the tech level mm -hmm. of the place, personal trait, species. So mm -hmm. everybody has a personal trait. Right, right. Klingon, human, Vulcan. Mm -hmm. So when a scene is being set, the GM can kind of give you the traits that are going to have. And these things can actually have effects. They'll have mechanical effects on the encounter, on the, the scene you're about to enter into. Mm -hmm. So even the equipment that you take with you can have a trait that's going to kind of change. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's the, the last trait to give us is the equipment trait. Oh, yes. And it's what, what you use it for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then they give a really good example. And if people remember the pilot of Deep Space Nine. Mm -hmm. If you don't, it's still pretty clear, but <laughs> Captain Sisko. Mm -hmm. Was he a captain at the beginning? Anyway, Sisko. Possibly Sisko, yeah, yeah. Sisko to his friends. And <laughs> Chief O'Brien mm -hmm. entered the Cardassian, the abandoned Cardassian space station. Yes. It's been trashed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the power is down and everything. And that's what Chief O'Brien's got to do. He's got to get the power back up. Right. So they were saying, like, this space station would have at least two traits, one of them being abandoned Cardassian station. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So that means the systems are going to be Cardassian as opposed to Starfleet. Right. So that might cause some complications. Mm -hmm. And the power is offline. And that's another trait. Then that, that would be a situation trait. One would be a location trait. One would be a situation trait. Mm -hmm. Test yourself at home and see if you guess which one. <laughs> That's a nice way to set, especially when you have away teams preparing themselves to enter these situations. That's kind of what the show always reinforced mm -hmm. is yeah. there's this kind of storm going on. There's, yes. you know, this yeah. kind of facility, you know, t if you take these kind of weapons, they'll be useless. The communicators won't work. There is no yeah. transporter, you know, access. They do a nice job of, you know, giving you, you know, what you're, what you're going to run into. And hopefully, especially with, with their point system, allow you to equip yourself to give you a little bit more of an advantage yeah. against those. Yeah. So you might be thinking like, okay, it's an abandoned Cardassian space station. That's what it is. Why is that a trait? Like, why why give it something special? And that's certainly what I thought when I was reading this. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, we're overcomplicating things. But right away, they explain why they have that. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, traits can be beneficial or detrimental. So mm -hmm. they either provide an advantage, so that provides a benefit, or they can provide a complication. Right. So, for example, if you're trying to communicate in a nebula, mm, right, that's going to be complicated. Whereas mm -hmm. if you're in a fight and maybe your your trait is Klingon mm -hmm. and in a melee fight, hey, I got a little advantage. I'm, I'm, I was born to fight melee right. with rubbish weapons. but <laughs> That helps prevent kind of situations of convenience or the, the GM being able to just play with it. Oh, no, your communicators don't work. Oh, no, the transporter is not effective here. That has That's established ahead of time. So you you have the, the effects you're going to be mm, dealing with yeah. and what you're going into. So there's not a lot of surprises and manipulation that, that may seem unfair or may seem not very logical. Logical by the right, but it, yeah, when you establish, I mean, it, I think it actually brings you more into the game as mm -hmm. opposed to takes you out. Yes. So if I walk into the space station, which you walk in, you say, okay, I'm just going to let you guys know that it has two traits, uh, abandoned Kardashian space station and powers offline. Mm -hmm. So you know that. I mean, you listen to that and one of them definitely sounds like a complication, like the power is offline. Right. You've got to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why traits are so good is because it tells you what you need to deal with. Yes, yes. And the other is, well, it's a Cardassian space station. So if I go to use the computers, I might have some problems because it's Cardassian. Right. And it, I think it's really fair to the players. But Star Trek, and definitely emphasized in this book, is all about problem solving. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And I mean, sure, it's dealing with conflicts, but it's different types of conflicts. Mm. And here it's like, hey, here's some problems to solve yeah. and right away. Or, okay, I'm going to let you know you're in a nebula. 
probably people familiar with the game are going to go, Nebula is a trait. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's going to have these complications. But, you know, somebody in Starfleet would know that. Yes. When we're in a Nebula, we're going to have these type of complications. And here it just gets you ready. I mean, this is what the situation is. Mm -hmm. So it's not like a a game master reading box text and you're going, is that important? Yeah, right. (laughs) What does that do? Plus one? Minus one? (laughs) So, yeah, you walk in, you set the scene. Mm -hmm. You describe it all you want. Everything's destroyed. Okay, I'm going to let you know. Two trades. Blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And you're like, all right. Until we get rid of, and here's why traits are important. Until you get rid of power as mm-hmm. offline, mm-hmm. that's going to always be, yeah, right. you're always going to be running up against that. Right. And you can also provide advantageous traits. Yes. And, and create those. Yeah. So maybe you want the nebula. Mm-hmm. So you're in a little space shuttle. And I'm borrowing this example from later on in the book. You're a space shuttle with a ship of the line coming at you. You're toast, except I'm going in to the nebula. Right. And I'm going to give myself, again, give everything like that, that trait. Yeah, I think that's I think that's that's well done, and I think it helps because a lot of players are going to be approaching this, especially if they're Star Trek fans, with a lot of logic. And yeah. so, if things are just going to oh whatever or roll on a table or that's what it says here, it's going to be unsatisfying to those players that really want okay, so I, I'm going to figure this out. And they even specifically address, and this is you know later in the mechanics, but information gathering and kind of how mm, you know, per- I- how perception works and how you gain information. So going into these situations, yeah. so I think that there's a lot of logic there and a lot of interesting yeah i like how they provide some people coming from a more narrative background might think that they're applying too many rules to things or applying rules to things that are normally role played but i Mm. really liked how they did it and i really Mm -hmm. thought it captures the star trek vibe yeah as far as i can tell yeah it's Mm -hmm. Some other jargon, tasks. Mm. And it's just an attempt to achieve something. Right. And as Jeremy said, when you roll the 2d20, you're trying to... The basic tasks just need one success. And so you've got a pretty good chance rolling 2d20 mm-hmm. of a success, especially if it's something that you have some skill in because your target number, what you're, you're rolling is based on an attribute, which is like a, a stat, one of your statistics, plus a, a discipline. So something that you've, you've trained in or you're educated in that will give you yep. that target number. And we'll get into what they specifically are a little yes. bit later. Yeah. Add to that plan your focus. Yes, right. Right, which helps you be more successful in something. Those people familiar with the 2D20 system might notice that we're not mentioning expertise. Mm -hmm. And I think this is one of the improvements that Star Trek Adventures makes over Mutant Chronicles or Conan is they get rid of expertise. Yes. Which can be confusing for people. So just to give people a little bit of background, like for example, in Mutant Chronicles, you'll have a skill Mm -hmm. and then the skill has an expertise number and a focus number. Right. I think they've decided everybody kind of associates like a skill has a number Mm -hmm. and that number like helps you succeed. And the thing that they're adding extra is this thing called focus, which makes you more successful, Mm -hmm. like increases the number of successes you could get. Right. So they've gotten rid of the the name expertise and Mm -hmm. just move that number into the actual skill, which makes sense. I just thought it was just much clearer. Also, focus works a little differently because you do have skills and they do have a focus once you have a certain rank or Mm -hmm. if you've chosen them in a certain way, like with Mutant Chronicles. And here a focus is just kind of a specialization and the characters are kind of allowed to freely, like you're given, here's two focus. So take your disciplines mm-hmm. that you have. And so if you're a discipline in science and maybe you want to specialize in botany or something, right. so do something not crazy specific, but to help give you something that you will be a specialist in, you'll have advantage in, and it's going to be relevant to to the adventures. Right. So you take your attribute in your discipline mm-hmm. and that number, let's say that number is 12. Mm-hmm. That's going to be your target number. So you need to roll that or under. Right. Under 2d20. Now, mm-hmm. if you do it with both, then you're going to get two successes. Mm-hmm. Now, when we hear about the number of successes, the difficulty number in this game is the number of successes you need to do. Right. Normally, it's one, mm-hmm. but it actually can go from zero to five. Right. right? And that's why uh, a focus uh, comes in handy, or as Jeremy mentioned earlier, rolling a one comes in handy. Mm. Now, the focus means that the number of, of your discipline, so let's say it's science, as Jeremy said, is is Three. Every time you roll like a three, two, or one, you'll Mm. get double successes. Yes. If you don't have a focus in something, then every time you roll a one, you'll get a double success. Mm -hmm. That helps because successes power what they call momentum in this game. And I believe it was called momentum in Mutant Chronicles as well. Yeah, that that same yeah, that's, mechanic. That's consistent. Right. And, and they explain that in this part of the book in basic operations, you receive momentum points every time you get more successes than required. Right. 
So if difficulty number was one, so you needed one success, you got three, now you now have two momentum. Right. So you can either spend those additional successes for more positive effects. So if you were hunting for food, you gathered more food, or if you were uh, attacking someone, you really damage them. If you don't need those extra successes, you turn them into momentum, and then that momentum is shared by the group. So people have access to that mm -hmm. to kind of help them for, with their task goals. Right. Yeah, there's like a, a momentum pool. It's a group pool, which you can get up to six in there. Right. And at the end of every scene, you'll lose like a moment. Right, right. So you're always trying to stock that up. Yeah, and I, I think, so that's one more than Mutant Chronicles. Mutant Chronicles was maximum five, but they didn't specify the mechanic of when a scene ends. You know, to transition to another scene, you lose a momentum. Mm -hmm. They didn't specifically have that mechanic. So it was a kind of the GM's discretion when you cleared the board and the momentum pool was empty. Right, right. And then we look at the zero, a zero difficulty number. Oh, right. And then why would you do that? It is what you would think. There's a zero difficulty number, so you don't have to roll anything. Mm -hmm. But you might choose to, to gain momentum. Yes. Of course, then you risk getting a complication. Yes. So if you roll a 20, you're going to get a complication, mm -hmm. which will, I think adds to the GM's the threat pool. Threat, yes, yeah. so the threat. So that's kind of the counter to the player's momentum. So the momentum can be spent to help to aid the players. The threat can be spent by the GM to complicate or create difficulties or create further further challenges to the players. It's a nice dynamic. So the, the die roll can produce a positive, a negative, or a very positive, or very negative that has lingering effects. Yeah. So that those points that are generated, you know, kind of continue throughout the entire scene. Right. Now, we can use momentum to do a few things. You can use it to improve an outcome, as Jeremy said. Mm -hmm. Like, you, for example, you get more information. Right. Or you can deliver more damage. I think biggest difference between spending momentum in Star Trek Adventures as opposed to Mutant Chronicles is when you spend, you can't spend momentum for an automatic success. The kind of automatic success mechanic works very differently than it did in, in Mutant Chronicles because it has to be more character-based. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a totally different system. But there are auto successes, but it doesn't, it's not just generated yeah. only by momentum. And they do an interesting thing is you spend one momentum to ask your game master one question. Mm, right. Yeah. yeah, I like that. As far as information gathering, if you have a momentum pool and you're kind of digging for information and clues, yeah, you, you have currency for that. Or you can spend two momentum to create an advantage, mm -hmm. to remove Remove a complication. Right, right. Or to create a complication. Yes, yeah, that seems a little counterintuitive, but I guess there are but situations. But you create a complication for somebody else. Or you can, what they call, gain an opportunity, and that's just adding the d20, as you said. Mm -hmm. Or create a problem, yes. which is you spend two, and you can increase the difficulty right. number of your opponent, yes, with, yes. which is be the game master, by one. Mm-hmm. I thought that was a very a very fun thing to do, especially if you've been rolling really well as a group. Those points are, are well named. The difference also that I notice with spending momentum is, of course, one momentum buys an additional D20, but for a second D20, then it's two momentum. And then for the third, it's three. So you actually, yeah. you have to have quite a lot. You can't. And so you're rolling maximum of five dice. You can buy three maximum and the, the price of them increases yeah. you know, after each purchase. So that also has another effect later with another system. But I think that's a, a nice way to, to kind of decrease that momentum. The momentum spend is pretty high if you're really, if you really want a lot of successes. Yeah. yeah. And then on the flip side, you have the game master who has a thing called threat. And the game master has his, his or her own pool. So they can spend, for example, two threat to create a complication. Mm -hmm. They can spend threat to get reinforcements, which was... I really like that. Instead yes. of the game master thinking, this is too easy for the players, mm -hmm. so I'll just throw in some more goblins or throw in some more Klingons, here, the person's spending the threat. And I think it keeps everything fair, which I think is kind of Star Trek-esque. Mm. Yeah, I Just think so. keep it, like, everything's got to play by the rules. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think Star Trek fans pride themselves that the universe plays by a certain set of rules. Mm -hmm. It's consistent until it isn't. But, <laughs> yeah. The other thing that's interesting about threat that, is very thematic for Star Trek, I think, is one of the things that generates threat for the GM is someone using lethal force in a situation where maybe they, they don't need to. So mm. if you're using lethal force against an opponent, that automatically generates threat, which which makes sense. If it kind of makes non-lethal, you know, set setting phasers to stun is a better approach right. in, in most situations. So mm -hmm. I think that works really well with, with the theme of the game is that's the last resort instead of go planet side phasers blasting. Yeah. I think the final thing you can spend is a thing called determination. Mm -hmm. 
And right. everybody, every player starts with one, and you can have up to three, similar to Inspiration and Dungeons and Dragons. Right, right. Sort of. It has that same kind of mechanic. The interesting thing about it is that's very character based. So it's based on your values. Yeah. So, so yeah. So using a determination point. So that's what I was talking about earlier. That's the auto success. So you can use a determination point to give yourself an auto success d20, which actually counts as two successes. Right. But you have to justify that. Yeah. You have to, when you're creating your characters, you establish values of those characters and you say, in this situation, I believe this, so I will spend this point to do this. And an example from Spock is logic is the beginning, not the end of wisdom. So that is one of Spock's values. Mm. And we're going to talk when we talk about character creation is when you get these values. Right. But yeah, like you spend a determination to basically activate a value Mm -hmm. and then it can give you the ability to add a d20 to re-roll all the dice. Mm -hmm. Right perform another task Mm -hmm. to give you another action or create an advantage so it's pretty powerful but you got to justify it yes and there's two types of values one is the ones that the players have so it's a a phrase to describe their beliefs or Mm -hmm. customs right uh, their convictions and there's also directives which are mission specific values right yeah so those are similar to like in the fate system the uh, aspects Mm -hmm. or in 5e yeah ideals and bonds when you are rolling your character, those mm-hmm. values are the, the same sort of. So they, they help direct your role playing and they help give you, you know, more flavor to uh, your interaction. Yeah. Another people. example is the one from Warg. 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 <laughs> <laughs> casual so, fans, casual fans. Casual fans. <laughs> Warg. <laughs> at, least I, at least I could hear it was wrong. Yeah. yeah. That sounds wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Proud and honorable Klingon. Mm. And I got Klingon right. (laughs) (laughs) And after that, there's advanced training. And that deals with, it's it's a very short section, Mm -hmm. but it deals with things such as time challenges, which as you imagine is like, okay, you need this many successes for the task. Right. And you have so many intervals in which to achieve it. Mm. Or, you know, I mean, if you imagine like the ship sirens are going, you know, Mm -hmm. the reactor is going to explode unless you do something. Just before we leave momentum and actually getting additional additional uh, die for the die pool uh, task rolls is there's also aid by other players. So if they have a discipline that they can somehow justify would assist you, like a, a knowledge of physiology of Klingons or a knowledge of some scientific principle that would aid you in your, your task, then they would roll. And if they have a success, that would be added to the pool that, that you were generating. Teamwork with that away team. All right. And now you are reporting for duty. Yes. <laughs> So, and, and this is when it explains the errors of play. And as we said, it was Enterprise, Original mm-hmm. Series, and Next Generation. Right. Going to make a decision. Later on, when they talk about technology, mm-hmm. they explain what technology is available in each era. And I think Star Trek Discovery has shattered that. Because <laughs> then Colodex definitely don't come up before the original series. <laughs> and if you have that spore travel technology <laughs> already, then who knows? Yeah, they also provide how fast the different warps go. They do say, hey, if time's not an issue, it, oh, it's whatever. Right. But if people care, here's, yeah, what it, here's how long it takes. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, I saw that. Yeah, that table. Then they also give you your attributes. And your attributes all start at seven. And they are control, daring, fitness, insight, presence, and reason. Yeah, I like that they used kind of thematic attributes instead of just, you know, intelligence, strength wisdom, dexterity. But it can be a little confusing because they do have, for example, fitness would be kind of a a combination of endurance and strength. So when you're doing things physical, of course, you would rely on fitness. I think it's named pretty logically. But if you're a very kind of old school role player and you're not seeing those very recognizable stats, it's like, so what do I use for this? You know, what am I going to be using my chutzpah? Yeah, but if you think about it from Star Trek characters, Mm. you go, well, I know who's high and daring. Yeah, right. And we'll just say it doesn't give stats for the Star Trek characters. (laughs) Like we gave gave you some values for Spock and Worf, but they don't. I mean, there's quotes from Captain Kirk, but you don't see him stat it. Yeah. <laughs> and then they move on to your your disciplines, which mm-hmm. take the place of your skills, or they right. are your skills. Right. And your focus or your foci are your, your more specialized skills. Right, yeah, kind know? of, yeah, just a specialization or something yeah. that uh, might be relevant to, to your training. Yeah, and here you have command, con, engineering, security, science, and medicine. Mm-hmm. So you can, again, you can imagine... Yeah. Who is Beverly Crusher would be higher in medicine. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, single parenting. <laughs> yeah. And Worf would be high in security. Right. And then Wesley Crusher would be high in everything. 
until he got kicked off the show. <laughs> but here, I think, then they explain how you can combine the attributes with the disciplines. Mm -hmm. So first you might go, I mean, you can read the what control means. It means what you would think it means. Right. You can re read what daring means. It means what you think it means. But then you might wonder, well, what do I use to shoot a phaser? Yes. But then it explains when you combine things with discipline. I won't read them all, but I'll just go through like control mm -hmm. and how control can be used with each discipline. So control with command is to like coordinate a group of subordinates. Mm -hmm. Okay, makes sense. Control with con is to direct the starship through a difficult environment. Mm. Control with engineering is to adjust to repair a sophisticated device. Control with security is to attack an enemy from a distance. Mm. And uh, if you, you probably guess, daring and security is you close in. Yeah, right. <laughs> you go all Kirk on them. Uh, control with science is to perform a delicate experiment. And control with medicine is to perform a delicate procedures such as surgery. And they give an example for each one. Mm. After you go through each combination, I think it's pretty clear. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's certainly flexible, but how you used the attributes with the discipline. Yeah, I don't think it would be, you, you wouldn't take too many task roles and kind of the GM's guidance to kind of really have a, a handle on, okay, so I'm, I'm not going to try this because I don't, I have very low control, or I'm definitely gonna, going to try this because I have, you know, high presence or, or high uh, reason. Yeah. yeah. And all your disciplines start at one. And then next up is the life paths. And this is oh. very much a 2D20. I think uh, we've seen this. Yeah, we've seen thing. this in every kind of character creation. Yeah. About this, I did like that they didn't have a point by system and they gave you the ability to, you know, choose from the options. And there were six options in most of the in most of these steps. So you could either roll a D6 on a table for kind of random generation, which is probably very useful for the GM, and then also, you know, allow you to kind of min max or kind of customize mm -hmm. the, the type of character that you wanted to play. So we should say like in Mutant Chronicles, for example, they provided both a point by mm -hmm. and a random roll. Right. And a combination of the two. Yes. Yeah. Here you could select everything, mm -hmm. but it's not not so much a point by you're just choosing something and then up applying the bonuses that they give right. or you can roll and then you, you still have some choice but i thought this life path creation system is the best of all the d20s yeah. it made a lot of sense the people who listen to our conan episode may have heard me go on and on and on <laughs> about how tedious mm. the steps were for conan uh, the couple reasons it was there was nine of them here there's only seven mm -hmm. but in here, and I think you'll agree after we explain the steps, is that each step has a very clear role. Yes. And it's clearly understood. Whereas, for example, in Conan, they might be cast as one of them, and that mm -hmm. maybe makes you farmer or barbarian. And then it was, I'm going to say profession, but I know that's not the, the word they use. And that's like, you now you're archer or mm -hmm. something else. Right. Where, I don't know, it, it and then didn't seem like, to build. Like war story, and there were things that were like, yeah. Okay. And they have something similar here, but... Everything really seemed to not only make sense, but flowed really well. Mm. Where you go through this and you're like, yeah, this is the order you need to put them in. Mm -hmm. Whereas like War Story was tacked on at the end, it seemed. <laughs> right, right. Even though it's about the similar spot here, it you understand why it's here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was nice. They definitely have pared things down, and and maybe it's also the setting because you're this is is a Starfleet. This is an academic setting. It's a military, you know, academic setting. So it should have a lot of logic, and there should be you know good progression kind of built into these characters. And, and I think maybe that's another reason. And I didn't think of it until you just said that. Maybe because it is you're playing a Starfleet officer, mm -hmm. whereas they don't have to have a life path system for every type of character yes. you would play right like one life path system for all the types of characters you might play in the conan world mm -hmm. that's yeah in mutant chronicles it's like here's mm -hmm. one life path system for all the different types of right and then the corp uh, corporations yeah, you they, might they play varied, plus yeah. if you played brotherhood or something mm -hmm. like that and maybe if they had presented or maybe something they could have provided in the supplemental books is you get like now an individual life path system well they, i think they do do yeah. that i remember yeah looking they through, do add different yeah. careers and stuff yeah, like yeah, that right. yeah yeah they add more special specialization yeah. than you have in the core book with Mutant Chronicles. Yeah. yeah. But here, because they are being so specific, mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's not needed. Without further ado, <laughs> step one is your species. Right. And this is a point of contention, I think, with a lot of people that were looking forward to playing Seven of Nine or Worf. Isn't she a Borg? <laughs> she is. Well, but kind isn't of a, she... 
And Isn't she the only one ever? She is the only. Well, well and that's that's the thing. That's the well, that's the thing one. that people. Yeah, they want to be the exceptional. They want to be the the specialist, most uniquest character. So when the you know, their their dream race, their alien race, and there's not really a logical reason for that race to be in Starfleet Academy. It's it seems a little difficult. But this is where the first complaint comes from because you know we've already been shown every named alien race in in Star Wars is playable. Well, we'll let you decide right. if you have enough. Decide for yourself. So they give you Andorians, Bajorans, Betazoids. And I, I didn't get these at first, and I'm like, oh, yeah, Deanna of Troy, right? Right, yeah, yeah. constantly teary-eyed. Yeah, I really didn't like that character <laughs> until maybe the end. Denobulans, Denublians, yeah. humans. Mm. I think I got that right. <laughs> I've seen them before. I didn't yeah. know what their name was. Uh, Tellarites. Yes. The yeah. dwarves of... The right, world. yeah, they're... The Trill. I knew I knew Trill. Yes. The Vulcans knew them. And that's it. That's it. Yeah. So what is that? Seven? Yeah. So seven playable races, which pretty standard for a you know, core book and yeah, an D&D, elf, dwarf, human, half orc. Right. Uh, I think uh, Tiefling is in the main mm, one. Right. Yeah. I think it is now. And yeah. uh, Dragonborn. And they, they do actually specify that, that you can be mixed race you can, or mixed interspecies, I guess you would say. In this game, you can choose mixed parentage if you want to take advantage of, of two types of bonuses. Or yeah. Something. And your species gives you uh, your species trait. Mm -hmm. So an Andorian, you can reduce the difficulty of tasks to resist extreme cold or tasks impacted by low temperatures. And then each one gives you plus one to three attributes. Mm -hmm. So the Andorans give you plus one to daring, control, and presence. Mm. And then you get a talent, and you choose one of the two that they offer. Right. And here you can be proud and honorable. You, I mean, you won't break a promise. And if somebody tries mm -hmm. to make you, or betray an ally, if somebody tries to make you do that, you can reduce the difficulty. In that. And you can be the Usan, which is a tradition of honor dueling. Go with the melee weapon. Mm-hmm. And pick and fight. Ice miner's tool. A razor sharp? Really? Okay. <laughs> Ice planet. Yeah, okay, but they wouldn't develop something more than, <laughs> oh, well, well, the miners have pretty much figured it out. Right. So we'll just right. use that now. <laughs> yeah, I wonder like why a... we never use pickaxes for dueling tools. Maybe because of r rubbish tools. Like, humans must, like, mop up in these duels. <laughs> it's like, oh, he's got a pickaxe. Yeah, all right. With zero range. Okay, yeah, when... He, right. when when he exposes himself, that's when I'll stab him in the stomach. You know. That happens. A lot. How do you parry with that? <laughs> yeah, depending on your GM, I don't think the complaint about the alien races is not very credible when you, if you have a flexible GM, of course, he's going to help create that kind of character. If you need to be that special, <laughs> specific species, Although I'm sure. Although Klingons, mm -hmm. Worf's on the, or he's in Starfleet. Right. And then there's another show that has a Klingon. Yeah, she's like, yeah, half human. She's half, yeah, half, half human. So half. how rare is it? I don't know. What's well, too rare for this this the scope right, of this right. game? <laughs> Next, you choose a character's environment, and that'd be like your home world, right? Uh, and this would give you a value. So as we we talked about, mm -hmm. and plus one to one attribute, and plus one to one discipline. Mm. And the environments are home world, busy colony, isolated colony, frontier colony, starship or star base, or another species world. Oh, so that would explain. Uh, May Michael Burham. Right. Right. Yeah, human on Vulcan. So it would be very awkward. That would be your value. <laughs> <laughs> awkward. <laughs> yeah. I value awkwardness. Yeah, I thought that was pretty good. I mean, it certainly made sense to introduce value there. Uh, mm. Oh, yeah. I mean, you are where you come from, mm -hmm. of, so to speak. Right. And then step three is your upbringing. This will give you attribute you plus two to one, plus two to another. And they actually tell you which ones to apply it to. Mm. Yeah, based on the, the choices. Yeah, and it, it, I like that where your upbringing, did you accept your upbringing or did you rebel against yeah, it? Yeah. So for each point. each one has that. Mm -hmm. And if you accepted the upbringing, for example, it would be like Starfleet, business or trade, agricultural or rural, science and technology, artistic and creative, diplomacy and politics. Mm -hmm. So if you... I suppose Kirk would be Starfleet. His dad was in Starfleet, right. and he kind of rebelled against it. Mm -hmm. That moves somebody from Starfleet who's plus two control, plus one fitness, to plus two daring. Hello, Kirk. Mm -hmm. Right. And plus one insight. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Did that, he that have extra sense. insight? I don't know. And I think he's more fitness, <laughs> but yeah. Anyway, <laughs> dating insight possible. Yeah. And you also get you increase a, a discipline, and you get a focus. Mm. And now you've entered Starfleet Academy, and then you choose your track, command track, operation track, and sciences track. Right. So you get your color, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to guess red, yellow, and blue. <laughs> yes, I think I think so. The thing that I liked about the life path in this game is if you want to play as cadets, 
that's where you stop the character creation. You can, if you're, if you're not going to be Starfleet officers, if you're not going to be, um, you, you can cut the career. You haven't entered, you haven't begun your career. You're just in the academy. So you can actually, if you want to play cadet characters, that's where you would stop the, the character creation. And of course they would be underpowered, but they would also be, you know, young, young, inexperienced players. And I, mm-hmm. I thought that was a nice choice because the previous life paths we don't have, it's, you know, beginning to the end and follow mm-hmm. through all of these yeah. steps. That, that was a nice option because it, it gives some flexibility. If you do want to start people kind of really young and inexperienced and let them kind of forge their own path or kind of move in in the directions that they want to, because the way that the experience works, which there isn't really experience in this uh, system, the way that that works, that that would be very useful. And you could level up cadets pretty quickly that would give them, put them on equal footing with with officers after after a few adventures. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And here you get uh, a value, another value, Mm -hmm. and you get attributes, you gain three points, you can split those between two two and three attributes. So if you do the math, that means everyone, three get plus one or one gets plus two and one gets plus one. Right. You have to select the discipline and then increase that by two. And then you can increase two other disciplines, increase those by one each. Now, for example, if you choose a command track, you have to choose either command or con right, as right. your primary one. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You have to. And then you get three folk guy. They call it focuses though. Oh, really? Focuses? <laughs> yeah. Focuses. <laughs> I, I think it's like, 40k they call them codexes oh yeah they do codices yeah Yeah, that's right right. Uh, they made a joke it was like it's high gothic not (laughs) latin all right and then we get into career and this actually follows up on what jeremy's saying Mm -hmm. sure you could have stopped at cadet right but then in career you choose whether or not you want to be a young officer an experienced officer a veteran officer and if you're an experienced officer the middle one you can choose your i mean y'all for all three you choose a value Mm mm-hmm for the experienced officer, you choose a, a single talent cho- chosen freely. Mm. If you're a young officer, you choose or you, you're given untapped potential, which oh. has special rules. Oh. And it limits how high your attributes and disciplines can go, but mm. then you get extra stuff. Right. And a veteran who doesn't have the same limits as the young officer, mm-hmm. they get that talent of veteran. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was neat. Yeah, Did no, I think that's... Play them at three stages of their career. There could be interesting situations or, or scenarios where you have a, a strange combination of a mixed crew that would, yeah, would make that very, very fun. And then that's followed up with career events. Right. And so this is the this is the first table that's actually a D20 roll. So there's a lot of things that can happen in your career. Yeah, everything else has been kind of six options uh, previously. And this is this is a much, yeah, much bigger variety. So that's going to give people's careers a lot more nuance and... No, that's right. That's a good point. Like we we should say like you could have chosen like your environment Mm -hmm. or you could have rolled a D6 and have the environment chosen for you. Mm -hmm. Except for young officer, experienced officer and veteran officer. Right. You choose that. Yes. Yeah, that has to be. I suppose you could make that roll. (laughs) It doesn't give you the table. So I I think you'd be lost. Oh, that would be. How do I work that out? (laughs) D3. Yeah, we're not going to read through all 20 of them. (laughs) Ship destroyed. Transporter accident. Mm, no. <laughs> what, what is that? <laughs> what? Your head is now now on your stomach or right. something. You know. Yeah. You're merged with a fly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, first contact. You solved an engineering crisis. Mm-hmm. No. But it doesn't matter because you get your you get an attribute. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you, your attributes are like one attribute is increased by one, mm-hmm. one discipline is increased by one, and then you gain a focus. And they give you some examples, and, and they're good examples. Yeah. So, so even yet a ship destroyed, it does give you valuable experience. Mm-hmm. Now, now, if you're the one keeping destroying the ship, imagine if you roll that twice, <laughs> keep getting a ship destroyed. <laughs> yeah, you like come with a curse, and and the. <laughs> The game does have reputation roles. Yes. Uh, yeah, I like that very much, especially if, you know, campaign related. I think that's very fun. No, I like that. Yeah. And finally, you get finishing touches where you get another value. Uh, you can, and here with your attributes and your disciplines, it does stress like you can't be more than 12, I think, right. for a starting character. Mm-hmm. And you can't have a discipline higher than five for a starting character. Mm-hmm. Then if you don't have those limits, then you can increase two disciplines by one and two attributes by one. Mm, right. Yeah. So basically, yeah, they're not going to let you have a target number of, of 17. You know, so you're not going to be starting with above 17. That's mm-hmm. kind of the maximum. It, that's as daring as you're going to get. <laughs> and then, yeah, just walk you through some like bookkeeping stuff, like how to create things like stress. And, oh, right. And your damage bonus, I mean, uh, which is equal to your security discipline. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's very thematic. When I first read that, I'm like, your security plus, and, oh, of course. Yeah, that's those are going to be the people trained in combat. You're not going to be training your doctors and your scientists. 
in combat, it's going to be the security officers. And then you can also get a supporting character. Right. Yeah, so that's what I referenced earlier, which I think is a really nice mechanic because in this world, you are specialized. You know, you're specialized for you're flying the ship, you're, you know, you're on the bridge, you're in the med bay, whatever your specialty is. So on away teams, you may or may not be needed in certain situations. So your supporting character kind of gives you the option of participating, you know, planet side, being beamed down when your main character has really no reason to be there. Mm-hmm. I like I like that because when I, I first read that, that solved the problem. That solved, you're, you're not just going to be on communication from the ship and be sitting this one out. It, mm-hmm. it keeps you involved. So you're not playing your main character, but there's a nice relationship between your, your main PC and the supporting character. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And then it moves on to the talents that you get. Just some examples. You might be bold. Mm-hmm. You might be studious. Those are some generic talents. Command talent is like, follow my lead. You're a supervisor. Mm-hmm. Engineering talent. I know my ship. Right. And for a lot of them, especially the ones specific to the disciplines, you have a, a requirement. So, for example, I know my ship. You need an engineering. I know my ship. You need an engineering of four plus. Mm-hmm. And you add one bonus D20. Right. Yeah. So your, your talents are going to give you... So specific situations give you automatically that extra die. Yeah. Which, which also means... That, so that actually goes back to using momentum to buy dice. Mm-hmm. So if a talent gives you automatically another die, then you're starting at two momentum for the next mm-hmm. extra die. So That's it kind point. of yeah, puts you a little bit further up the, the cost chart mm-hmm. for using momentum to power your, uh, your die pool. And next in the book is about advancing or character development. Mm-hmm. So it gets into milestones. Right. When I didn't see XP, and that's something you're very used to seeing in RPGs, how are they going to handle this? But I, I think this milestone system is great. I mean, it, it's thematic and it it has a, a nice logic to it's It's exactly what would happen once you had 2000 XP, but it's handled more based on situation. And there's even a certain type of milestone that's voted on by the group. So I think that's it's a great idea. It really keeps people participating and saying, you were the most Star Trek <laughs> of this mission. <laughs> no, you were. No, you were. And reputation. Mm. And they, all characters start with a reputation of 10. Right. Yeah. And so the range is yeah, 0 to 20, and those all have effects on mm-hmm. what, you're, how, what you're able to do yeah, within, mm-hmm. uh, within the world. And, and in a campaign situation, that's going to limit your options or maybe open up certain opportunities mm-hmm. that, that you would or wouldn't have based on reputation. Yeah, including getting promoted. Yes. Yeah, right. How right. to work that in. I think it's a good example of how the Game Master has a lot of not overly complicated rules, but has rules to support decisions like that, like who does mm. get Yes. Promoted. Right. Yeah. yeah Instead I, of going, yeah, you've been role playing well. You're promoted now. You're right. a captain. <laughs> right. It may be looking at this from the outside, kind of a, a military structure or, you know, some sort of governmental structure that may not be the the kind of friendliest system to play in. So when they give the uh, the game master some some nice guidelines and, and ways to advance characters that kind of fit what Starfleet would be doing and how people would gain promotion. And then next up is the final frontier. Yes. And if you no, the original series, space. Final one <laughs> so it gets into space. So it's strange new world, mm-hmm. the different planet types. Right. And walks you through like the different dangers a planet might have and how that relates to damage. Yes. Uh, yes. Stellar phenomena. And they're placed in order of severity. Mm. So they have different categories. The difficulty increases accordingly. Mm. If So if you're operating in nebula versus if you're operating in a bla- near a black hole, in a black hole, <laughs> near a black hole. Uh, I think a nebula is like one. It adds one to your difficulty. Mm -hmm. Something further down the line would add like three difficulty or even five difficulty. Right. So again, I think that rule, which at first might be, I I don't want to say frustrating, but people might say, oh, there's one more rule. Mm -hmm. But it's a pretty simple rule to wrap your head around. Mm -hmm. And everybody's now on the same page. Yes. Everybody should know. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah. Yeah, And and this, this rule book reads... It reads so clearly. And also, like, as you're reading it, you can say, yeah, I can see what's going to be on this Game Master screen. Mm-hmm. You kind of read this. Sometimes you read a rule book and you're like, well, what's, what, would, what is the most important information? And here yeah. you're like, hey, that's pretty small. Yeah. I can put that on a Game Master screen. No, it's that's true. Easy. And then we get into scientific discoveries and developments, which I really like. Mm. I think this was also kind of a, a little bit of an anxiety for people that are very serious about Star Trek because the technology and the science is so much a part of it. This isn't space opera. This isn't space fantasy. So things have to make a certain amount of scientific sense. And there has to be, I think they even reference how to use the scientific method. Like there's a, mm-hmm. there's a mechanic in the system for using the scientific method to, to test hypotheses. So I think that's a great way to honor that science-based tradition of Star Trek. I yeah. thought it was it was excellent. Mm-hmm. And it's three steps. You observe. You can observe using engineering, science, or medicine. Mm-hmm. 
because it's science. Right. And then you step two is a hypothesize. And this is great. I mean, you sit around and it encourages players to brainstorm and think of ideas, which is very Star Trek. Yes. yes. You got a problem and people, everybody gathers around and comes up with maybe five ideas or something. And the mm-hmm. game master is thinking, okay, one of those is plausible. <laughs> one of those is what I think they call it the right way. Yes. Yes. We'll then not say which one is the right way, mm-hmm. but we'll say, yeah, you're on the right track or right. you move on to step three, which is testing. And you need a number of successes in which to to achieve your uh, hypothesis or to test your hypothesis. Mm-hmm. If the group in step two don't come up with a, a reasonable solution to the problem, mm-hmm. the game master would send them back to the drawing board and said, nah, none of this is going to work. Yes. Mm-hmm. And then I think, I believe it adds a complication mm-hmm. or something mm-hmm. to the situation. So maybe they've run out of time. So now stuff starts breaking down on the ship. So they gotta, they're got they under pressure mm-hmm. to do it. But I, I really like this. Yeah, I thought that was... That was really great. It 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 just fits. Yeah, it fits really well. Yeah, I remember I was messaging you guys when I was reading this, and after I read the life path mm. and, and the explanation of the D twenty system, I was like, this actually might be a refinement on the D twenty mm. oh, system yeah. presented in the previous books. Mm-hmm. And then after I read about the scientific method or how they address it here, I messaged where I was thinking like in a book based on an IP, mm-hmm. the rules are more important than the fluff. Yes, because yes. How the rules deal with the IP is more important in the role-playing game because they can actually go to the original source to get all the fluff. Mm-hmm. So, true. yeah, I wasn't so impressed with the overview and, and that, but I can go watch Star Trek episodes to mm-hmm. find out more about Cardassians, right. uh, the Star Trek wiki. Right, yeah. Uh, I'm sure there's one I haven't actually checked. <laughs> I have not had that. I'm sure there's several, yeah. <laughs> and they all are conflicting. Uh... Going to war. <laughs> when everything up. Uh, then we get into conflict. And right. very Star Trek starts with social conflict. Yeah, I thought that was interesting that yeah, the physical combat and melee and everything was kind of first, it's social. First, you're going to want to reason and, and negotiate. Mm-hmm. You're not going to want to fight, which is, yeah, maybe very new for some people that are used to, you know, D&D or just, you know, very combat doing damage. Yeah. And they had four main ways to do it. Deception, evidence, intimidation, and negotiation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think that works well. And also, so if you've powered some of those attributes, that's going to make a big difference in how effective you are. So you may be able to do nothing physically, but you're going to be very powerful mm-hmm. with having your, your party get their way in a lot of situations. And that's always going to be the first step in a very Star Trek way. Yeah. yeah. And then follow that with conflict. And they've divided what you can do in conflict, which, mm-hmm. which is combat, into minor actions and tasks. Mm. What I like about the minor actions is they actually can do stuff oh, right. to what your task is. For example, you can aim. Mm-hmm. And that's going to make things more accurate. Also, certain weapons that you pick can allow you to really use aim. Yes. Yeah. yes. And of course, also combat has its own momentum spends. So there's a whole table of if you're in combat and mm-hmm. you're spending momentum, these are the effects that it can have. So yeah. it's not just additional die or some advantage. It's it's very specific, you know, disarming or extra mm-hmm. damage or, or things that will be very combat effective. Yeah. And then you also, we, we talked about the challenge die earlier, mm-hmm. the, the, the funny D6 right. or the specialized D6, a better way to put it. <laughs> and that, we're saying it's primarily like a damage die, mm-hmm. but it's also a resistance die. Yes, yes. Yeah, resisting the damage. But so it's around the damage idea. Mm-hmm. So, so either causing the number of damage or, or reducing it. Yeah. And then we get into technology. And they actually kind of funny about carrying capacity, but it makes but it makes perfect Star Trek sense in you're allowed to carry up to two items. <laughs> yeah. Maybe if somebody invented pockets in Star Trek, game changer. <laughs> right. Belt clips is the most you're going to get. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Well done, Star Trek Adventures. Well done. <laughs> And they present the tech in different eras, like mm-hmm. what it is. And here, when we say it's technology and we're kind of blowing through it, it doesn't actually like give you a bunch of stats on technology here. Right. They give weapons a little bit later and they walk you through what all the weapons are. They walk you through what the damage effects are. There's like area, intense, knockdown, piercing, X, vicious, which mm-hmm. inflicts more damage. Mm-hmm. Weapons have different qualities such as cumbersome or deadly or accurate. Yeah. Right. So along with technology, they also have uh, cybernetics. So they refer to augmentations that, that players can have. It wouldn't be equipment that you carried. It would be something kind of embedded in your body itself. Yeah, so that covers your Geordie LaForges. And a chapter I'm sure everybody's excited to hear about is A Home in the Stars. Ah, yes. And that's, that's starships, star bases, and colonies. Right. And after this part, this subchapter just explains what those are. Mm-hmm. And then it gets into... Starships. Starts off with the rules. And of course, 
a Star Trek game has to have starship combat. It has to handle this because I think Starfinder does the same thing where your party, your group of people are based on a ship because that's that's how you're going to get around. Mm-hmm. You can't just kind of randomly be hitchhiking together. Mm-hmm. You have to actually oh, be definitely. a crew yeah, of a ship. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could probably play, people could probably figure out, hey, I could play Star Wars without a ship. Mm-hmm. I'm sure a lot of Star Wars games have been played outside of ships, but man, you got to play Star Trek in the ship. Yeah, yeah, right. So starships have traits. Mm-hmm. As we talked about, I can't remember thinking about a species trait. Right. There are starship traits. For example, Federation starship mm-hmm. and what that entails. Right. There's also starship also has systems and that goes from zero to 12. And that sounds pretty familiar to the attributes. Right. <laughs> but those are communications, computers, engines, sensors, structure, and weapons. Yeah. Because there always is that, that relationship with the away team. It's like, well, what can the, the ship do to back mm-hmm. us up? Can yeah. they supply information, energy, you know, can they attack you know the yeah. surface yeah and also when you think about it, it doesn't really matter how good kirk is ha <laughs> ha of course it matters <laughs> i mean the ship can only do what the ship can do yes so it, it's got to have stats yeah right yeah. Have stats. right right and there's departments which from zero to five and that's command con engineering security science medicine hey we, we heard that before oh, yeah you know where to go yeah the idea of the departments is kind of the crew of the ship and how they can help what they can add to like the main characters mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm score on the on their discipline right yeah. so yeah so contributing characters would, yeah. would have a lot to do with like your ship and what you don't have within the pc the group of pcs yeah the contributing characters could be filling that's the stations that they are occupying and that's yeah. the, what they contribute and I, I think that really plays in well into the idea that the certain ships of the line have a definite role like the defiant i guess is very much a warship mm-hmm and then some ships are very much like a science exploration ship. So right, right. you're kind of going to be staffed to meet the primary uh, role of that ship. So, right. Yeah. There's no foci. Treat every task as if it had one. And uh-huh. the idea is that, again, you, you this ship is staffed with experts in every field. Right, right. So somebody's going to have, yeah, yeah, I'm a botanist. Mm-hmm. Great. Show up. What's this? <laughs> yeah. right. hey, you know, Brian's wife's a botanist. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it was kind of weird because she's like, oh, there's no position for me. And you're like, really? A botanist? And even O'Brien's <laughs> like, well, we just discovered an entire new quadrant. Or not, maybe didn't discover the gamma quadrant, but a new way to get there. And it's mm-hmm. like, yeah, we'll be able to, I'm sure there's plans. <laughs> there should be something you know. for you, did it? <laughs> no, but you can teach the kids. <laughs> yeah, right. you know. And then it has things like talent, scale. Mm-hmm. like how big it is resistance right. and resistance is pretty related to scale like the bigger the ship the more resistance it has shields mm-hmm. power and crew support and that's power is interesting like more power too. oh yeah, yeah yeah right but how much do you really have <laughs> yes and they, they kind of divide the actions you do you have actions on the ship mm-hmm. which you gain, a, gain an advantage if you can justify it right and actions as the ship or using the ship mm-hmm. and then there you use the ship stats mm-hmm I like how that was explained. And it keeps coming back to the characters justifying their values, their role, their skills to apply to a specific thing. So there's there's a lot of logic, but there's also, it's a nice mix of kind of logic and role play as opposed to, I, I just know that because, uh, I, I, you know, you can't improvise, you know, you're not improvising, you're, you're kind yeah. of using the relevant information. And so it has a nice logic to it, but it also feeds the role playing. Mm-hmm. And then you get into the positions and specific tasks mm-hmm. on it. And so like commanding officer, helm, navigator, and it goes through those. Then it explains how you attack. For example, if you're going to attack, you're going to have control plus security mm-hmm. assisted by the ship's weapons plus security. That makes a lot of sense. And it's nice that it's in a completely different system that they tie it to what they've already established with what characters do. And this definitely comes up when you look at the different types of ships. It's so easy to read the stat lines Mm -hmm. because it's very similar to the the characters. I mean, the ships are characters. Right, right. And they're treated that way. And they they have a specialty, yeah. Yeah, so you don't have a different way to read the ship. Like in most role-playing games, you know, here's how... how you read your character. Mm-hmm. Now we get into the equipment and the ships and you got to read it in a different way. Right, right. And there's a grid with armor points on all these positions. And yeah. yeah, yeah, right. I mean, or if you look at Dungeons and Dragons, and it depends what edition is, how close the monster stats look like uh, player character stats. Right, right. I mean, even if you simplify it, such as in a game like 13th Age, which really simplifies the monster stats, it's still like a different way to read something. Mm-hmm. Whereas here, it's like, let's make it as close as possible to the character stats. And yeah, I thought it was pretty clear, like, oh, that's that's a powerful ship. You mm-hmm. know, I, I, I kind of get that. 
And then it gets into the different types of ships. And one thing that threw me mm -hmm. is that they, I didn't notice it at first, but they ordered them alphabetically uh, as opposed to in order of weakest to strongest. Right, right. Which is, yeah, how they usually present uh, yeah. Yeah, ships and the scale and everything. So the Defiant came quite early <laughs> on D. And I was like, oh, I, I thought that was a really super awesome ship. Yeah. <laughs> But it also avoids complaints because if you put something like the Defiant or the Excelsior, like which oh, you yeah. put, I mean, maybe Star Trek fans are screaming, no, it's the Defiant. <laughs> it should be top or something because they have different roles. One mm -hmm. is a dedicated warship, whereas one is like an all around ship or a science and exploration. I think Excelsior is more of a science ship. Right. So, which is more valuable? What are you valuing more? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that, yeah, that so makes sense. Alphabetical it is. <laughs> In order of appearance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I'm reading it going, and it's this Enterprise. Yeah, right. And it's this Enterprise. But I guess the Enterprise changed types. Right. I think there's, yeah, a few different yeah. models. And it gets destroyed and all kinds of good stuff in the future and, films. And here they give you each Federation ship has its own picture. Yeah, it yes. also has sort of the background and like how it came about. Mm -hmm. So that, that was good. Yeah, I really like that. I thought I'm not the biggest fan of Star Trek ships. Mm-hmm. But I did enjoy reading that. And I was mm. like, oh, okay, I recognize that ship, mm -hmm. you know? That's, oh, yeah, yeah. That's the one Sulu is commanding at right. Undiscovered Country. And then we get into alien ships. Yes, yeah. And they're statted out, and each alien race gets a few. Mm -hmm. They don't get the history. I think that's the big difference between mm. the Federation and the alien ships is they don't get, hey, this is how that came about. But yeah. I guess if you think about it, this is the Federation presenting it. Mm -hmm. They're not going to say, oh, well, the Klingons discussed that they wanted this. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. And there may be, you know, source books coming for, you know, adventures based in, in certain alien races or certain certain settings that will give you a lot of that fleshed out. Yeah, not being an, a huge expert on Star Trek, I mm -hmm. felt that there was a lot mm -hmm. with the ships. Like, I didn't, I yeah, mean, yeah. maybe there was a ship type that was in a particular movie that is not presented for the, the Klingons or the Romulans or something like that. I don't, I didn't notice that big mining ship, the first Star Trek, in the, the Star Trek reboot. Right. Yeah, that With just the, destroyed yeah. everything. Yeah. <laughs> right. That was, yeah, Romulan, yeah, the big Romulan. But I guess that's mind. in a different era, so. Right, yeah, it has the. How do they deal with time travel? I didn't even think of that. Yeah. Because you have a different era, but. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I wonder if that's something that they're going to bring up that. Oh, that, I think you're coming up with, like, the, the dream source book for a lot of people. <laughs> right. The, the time travel Star Trek source book. Yeah. The All right, you, you heard it here. <laughs> you heard it here first, Modifius, time travel source book. I think there'll be a huge demand. Definitely. Yeah, uh, because you could do in canon stuff, and then you could have speculating, like, what if they went stat out Roman legions? I don't know. I, I think that would be really fun for a lot of players that really want to go crazy. I mean, there's probably in fans' minds certain things that they want to see, but there's also the kind of thrill of... Uh, Mirror yeah. universe. Yeah, right. Right. Even I know about that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, the GURPS to... had some excellent source books, like alternate history. Oh, yeah. Source books. Nice. Yeah. yeah. What if, like, the Romans won and, and different points in history, what it would be like. Yeah, it was really good. Wow. I think it will be interesting to see how kind of third party or, or just, you know, individual people are going to support this game because already Starfinder, I guess that's just the kind of Paizo spirit, but Starfinder had a lot of support and additional mm -hmm. things that people were writing. I'm so. going to say, or I, I would recommend Modifius keep a pretty tight grip on this. One thing, they, they pay for the IP. Yeah, that's true. It's it a lot get of money. Away from yeah. <laughs> yeah, it has an established canon. So mm -hmm. like Starfinder is like, hey, whatever. I, I, yeah, I, that's I created right. 10 new ships for Starfinder. <laughs> and like, oh, Okay. <laughs> It's good. Kind of looks like stuff out of Alien, but all right. Yeah, that, but that's here a good you point. gotta you gotta do the research and that. So mm -hmm. I think, and they obviously did... invested a lot in this system and really making it work with this IP. So yeah, yeah, it it could be very diluted by that kind of contribution. But they they've supported all of their systems pretty well. I mean, yeah. they're, they're constantly doing releases for all the RPGs that they publish. So yeah, hopefully this continues. And mm -hmm. it seems like there's this filled a hole that was kind of missing. Like people had tried to use different systems at previous RPGs mm -hmm. uh, with this IP to to play this and it just wasn't satisfying. Yeah. And from from what I've heard online, there's some people that are just like, this is it. I, this is exactly you yeah. know, a, a, a workable system. Yeah. 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 And I can see being unsatisfied with using something like a Starfinder mm -hmm. to try to make yes. a, a Star Trek because it's a very, very different mm -hmm. idea. Yeah, right, right. Of, of the play style is very different for one thing. Yeah, right, just very combat-based um, and, yeah, like not great rules for negotiation compared to what they're kind of, what they're focusing on here. Yeah. yeah. 
And now we get into the game mastering section. Right. Yeah, so the first 70 pages were the background and lore, and the last 70 pages of the book are all game mastering advice and strategies and systems to use. Yeah, I'm not, I don't have as much to say about the game mastering because mm. some of it is just general advice, maybe right. good advice mm-hmm. on how to game master and how to run a Star Trek game. Mm-hmm. It gets into character creation. When I got to character creation, I wondered how necessary it was Yeah, because it was just saying, you know, if players want this, then what, what should you do? But maybe for a, a new game master having to deal with players, making demands, wanting to play 7 and 9? Yeah. Yeah, seven and nine, like what to do with that. Right. I, I need to be half Klingon. I can't live without it. Yeah. yeah. But then it gets into experience and promotion, mm-hmm. how to create encounters, uh, creating missions, NPCs, and locations, which I thought was really neat. Oh, yeah. Rolling to create NPCs and rolling to create planets. Mm-hmm. They also had, like, for example, non-player characters, like like a random physical and mental traits. Mm-hmm. Some of them are pretty funny. Random behavioral and culture traits, which you could do, which it's pretty helpful. Like when you're on the spot, maybe you get, oh, yeah. the, get the alien of the week and you just want to give it a little oomph and kind of feel like you're stagnating. Hey, roll on the table. And it's like, yeah, you know, I wouldn't have thought to give my yeah. my alien that trait. Oh, I think that's that's true. And constantly they're, you know, encountering new species. Yeah. So that, that helps to throw some uh, yeah. kind of unknown some curves in there. Yeah, it helps to keep it fresh for you as the game master. Because yeah. like, oh, now I got to play this. Well, okay, <laughs> right. sure. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah, as a game master, you need that. You need to be thrown for, through a loop mm-hmm. a little bit. Like, mm-hmm. sure, the players can do that for you. But when you're creating something, it's like, you know, I've always default to this, like, warlike race, yeah. this honorable race. And, hey, okay. And, you know, this is really just a Ferengi that's a different color. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then you roll that and you're like, no, I, I feel like this is now something different. It's more than a, a different colored Ferengi. It's a, yeah. it's one that licks wrists. <laughs> I think I, I, something like that. They kiss wrists or lick right. wrists is one of them. I think that makes all the difference in the world. Yeah. <laughs> and we end up with aliens and adversaries. Mm, right. And I think this will maybe I misunderstood what you're saying, Jeremy, but yeah. I thought they provided a decent amount here. Yeah. As for the adversaries over something like Starfinder, but perhaps you were talking about the number of aliens yeah, that they play, were offering in yeah. character creation. Right. Yeah. So for playable races. Yeah. 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 So that was that was kind of the the argument that I had heard that, you know, we've yeah. already we've got this huge number of species and there's only seven you can play. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Right. And and here it's like the, the usual suspects. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right. So I think you might be able to guess what we're going to say, but what would you say? <laughs> what's your verdict on Star Trek Adventures? Well, I, I was surprised. I, I really was because there was a, a little bit of disappointment and not, it wasn't very satisfying to see the Conan IP with the 2D20. I, I think we yeah. were, we were real happy with yeah. that result and already kind of knew the Mutant Chronicles setting. So that system worked well. It, it was very, yeah. very functional there, yeah. but this, kind of match worked really well the the refinements that they made it just mm-hmm. it had a really good feel and constantly that the system reinforced the genre and i think that's so important yeah. for uh, making a satisfying yeah. game and we yeah. we, f- we found that with mutant chronicles too that yes yes yeah we could we could see the system and the world working well together mm-hmm. yeah so we haven't played it yet but we if oh. we find a and i should say it ends with the starting adventure but we didn't read through that because we don't know who's going to run it oh right yeah. right <laughs> that's right we got but there's an adventure at the end well, I would say that this is the best 2D20 system. It's not my favorite, which right. is Mutant Chronicles, because I like that world more. But just the way the system is done, like uh, the, the rule set just completely won me over. Yeah. Like I'm not a big Star Trek fan. And at the end of Star Trek Discovery, we kind of gave the TV series we most like to play in, but we kind of were actually in agreement, but we didn't really want to play Star Trek. Mm-hmm. And here I would play this game. Yes. Even though I not, don't necessarily want to play Star Trek, but I would want to play this game. Right. I think, I, yeah, yeah it, it's such a focused science fiction experience. I think that even if you're not a fan, I think there's some enjoyment there because those limitations and those kind of focused roles would be fun because it's it's something that maybe you wouldn't think of doing if you've just been playing Space Marines or been mm-hmm. playing Bounty Hunters. This is something going to be totally, a Absolutely. totally different experience. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, definitely a different experience that you're not going to get from Star Wars, Starfinder, which you can see overlap. Yeah. And you can see overlap with something like, well, even Mutant Chronicles. Mm-hmm. I, I think it has more diversity than something like 40K, but you can certainly see that it has a sister game in a sense. Yes. Yeah. Or a comparable game. But here, yeah, this is it's its own animal. Mm-hmm. And maybe Star Trek has always been its own animal. But I, I mm-hmm. read this wanting to watch more Star Trek. Oh, yeah. So I think it had worked on that level. And I think, so. I, I think I'd be really interested to see the next 2D20 system to see 
if they further refine it mm -hmm. or if they've kind of like hit it and like we know how to do it from yes we know yeah. how to apply the system to any ip now because we really got it because i think it's not that it was a happy accident i mean chronicles was certainly a lot of deliberate design but it, it worked mm -hmm. and then we saw it not work kind of a bland result with conan right, right and now we see it work even better yeah with star trek adventure so i i, I like that progress yeah me so, too yeah definitely a, a big recommendation for star trek adventures yeah uh, it's, and it's... this is for somebody who who calls War Four? So I'm not, I'm not a Star Trek fan. <laughs> We're not fanatics in any yeah. way. Yeah, and they make it very reasonable. The PDF is fifteen dollars, I think. Yeah, uh, you, yeah could, so. you could definitely buy in if you you don't want to do that. But I'm switching over to I I want to have that book. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Or the five hundred dollar Borg Cube, uh, which is the one with the silver cover. I like the silver cover. Oh yeah, yeah. They did like a collector's edition. Oh, yeah, because there's no Kickstarter for this. But actually, the thing that they said on the website about that cube is that. As more people buy it, that's going to fund them adding more things to it. Oh, so that's a question that I had. They're offering, of course, the custom tokens, the custom dice, but they also were showing miniatures for this game. Oh, they mentioned that in the rulebook. Yes. And so I was like, great, you'll have some kind of generic classes. And no, it's all famous name characters. It's the Next Generation crew. It's the original Star Trek crew. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it's like how, of course, collectors and fans would love those, but how useful are those in the game? I, I Damned if you do, damned if yeah. you don't. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. I think they they made the right call. Hmm. No, well, I They're going to get so. less complaints yes, than if generic they, yeah. captain number one. Right, because yeah. you're never going to match. And and especially with this system, there isn't a clear, oh, humans should play as this. Stats aren't going to align your role with your race yeah. the same way that uh, they do in other systems. But they don't actually have any of the characters right. in, so in maybe the rule book. That's so that's coming? I don't know. Yeah, but there are miniatures. What do they, what do they call them? The iconic characters? Like, I know yeah. Pathfinder does that. Right, yeah. Like, and they yeah. come out with the miniatures for the Starfinder yeah. and Pathfinder. So kind of named characters, yeah, that... Uh, yeah. You can, yeah. So maybe they'll have the that Vulcan woman from the original series era. Yes. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> so, yeah, very strong recommendation. Mm. I'm very pleased to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah. Because, uh, we, yeah, we're talking about being such 2D20 Uber fans mm. and then having to get such a, a poor review of Conan. It's good to come back. Yeah, yeah, I, I really think so. And this kind of snuck under the radar because I wasn't crazy excited about the IP. And there's, you know, so many PC games and, you know, Star Trek IP has been really shopped around. But yeah. it's great to see a nice product come out using the system and, and being a Starfleet simulator so that, you know, you have a, a really nice focus. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. I hope you found this really helpful. And uh, if you're still on the fence, maybe invest. $15 and have a look for yourself. Yes. I think you'll be really pleasantly surprised. I agree, yeah. All right, give it a shot. Bye. Bye. Drive through RPG. We average nine new titles a day. That's over 60 a week. And we've got well over 15,000 RPG titles online right now. Drive through RPG. The one true source for RPGs. <laughs>
Idle Red Hands, recorded in Kobe, Japan. See us online at www.idleredhands.com. Music provided by Tripod Jimmy, and the song was Roadkill. Hope you enjoyed it. See you next time. <laughs>